I want to ask you to stand with me now as we read together God's holy word. Our text this morning for the first Sunday of Advent is Isaiah 64, verses 1 through 9. Let us hear the word of God. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence, as when the fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, and that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome things that we did not look for, you came down. The mountains quaked at your presence. From of old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear no eye has seen a God beside you who acts for those who wait for him. You meet him who joyfully works righteousness, those who remember you in your ways. Behold, you were angry, and we sinned. In our sins we have been a long time, and shall we be saved? We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment." We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There was no one who calls upon your name, who rouses himself to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have made us melt in the hand of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Be not so terribly angry, O Lord, and remember not iniquity forever. Behold... Please look, we are all your people. Let's pray as we begin. Father, thank you that you have revealed yourself to us that we might know you. And in this, your holy word, you have spoken that your people might be encouraged, might be challenged, might be exhorted, might be rebuked and taught. As I pray today, as we attend to your word, that you would give to me wisdom and grace and boldness in speaking and that you would take your word and by your spirit press it not only into our ears and into our hearts, but into our lives, that we might reflect your glory to a world desperately in need of salvation. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Be be seated. Well, as you have undoubtedly gathered by now, today is the first Sunday in Advent. Um, we don't know where November went. Uh, no one has claimed responsibility for its disappearance, but it's pretty well gone. And I don't know where the month went. But uh, this, this season of Advent is now upon us. And, and it's typically, of course, the, the season for anticipating the promised return of Jesus. Um, and yet... Rather than a season of waiting, which is what the church has observed and recognized throughout the millennia now, the, a time to exercise patience, to, to look forward, to prepare for that promised second coming of the Lord, uh, our culture has made Advent the, the busiest season of the year. We've got stuff we have to do. And maybe you've noticed, it sort of struck me, uh, in this time of covid Particularly, it seems like Advent, as you see it in the advertisements, as you see it in the flurry of the season, it's become the locus both of nostalgia for a now sort of disappeared normal life and also the locus of hope that, that somehow or other, you know, normal will return, that, that we can make that happen. And that seems to be just embedded in, in the Christmas advertisements that we see. You know, we're all... We're all called to remember what it used to be and then in that memory base our hope for what we might have ahead of us. And yet, um, if we rightly understand Advent, it's not something that we do at all. It's not for us to be busy in. Rather, it's something that we wait for God to do. Th that Advent is a promise we hold on to through faith in the promise giver. We wait for God to fulfill his promise. And it's not up to us. But, you know, this, this age in which we live, this present age, is not one that is very congenial to waiting at all, especially <clears throat> waiting for something that only comes through faith. Uh, the world believes that it, it, it can secure its future by means of its own efforts. 
And yet, I think we can recognize that, that those efforts, no matter how ambitious, no matter how sincere, no matter even how frantic, they can never ensure that the future will be better than the past or that it'll be better than the present. You, you may notice my title this morning. Uh, it echoes that of Samuel Beckett's play, Waiting for Godot, which is about uh, two men who are waiting for a third man, Godot, who, who never shows up. They, uh, <coughs> they use the phrase waiting for Godot to describe that kind of thing where, where people are waiting for something to happen with no assurance that it ever will. So waiting for Godot just never happens. And it seems like people today are waiting for that Godot of normalcy, hoping that it will return. But, but our faith in, in Jesus Christ, the, the foundation of, of Advent, the, the foundation of the hope, the foundation of the promise, this Jesus as the, is the only Savior of, of mankind, the one alone through whom we have a relationship with God himself. Uh, that Christian faith is today widely viewed as exclusive, offensive. It's even hateful to believe those sorts of things. And yet, as believers in God's promised Savior, we need perhaps now more than ever to, uh, to be strengthened in our faith through a, a new appreciation of and, and a renewed participation in Advent not the commercial variety that we see in the media and in the culture around us, but, but in, in the real hope that looks to God's character alone, to his faithfulness as the only basis of confidence that the future, in fact, will be better than the present. And it's, it's that hope in which we wait. What a difference there is between waiting for God and waiting for Godot. And so, only by relying on God and waiting on Him, not just during the season of Advent, but through all of life, can we find the encouragement and the strength to face the challenges until that day when the Lord shall return. So, as we begin Advent, I want us to look back with me now at, at Isaiah chapter 64, verses 1 through 9, and we're going to see how God's people in those times learn to wait for the Lord waiting for God. Now, a little, little background. Isaiah lived during the decline of Israel in the shadow of Assyria. Uh, and we recognize that we know a little of our Bible history. After the death of Solomon, the kingdom was divided into the northern ten tribes and the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, the southern tribes. And in roughly 722 or so, the northern tribes fell to an Assyrian invasion. Now, Isaiah spoke during that time warning of impending disaster, but, but God told him from the beginning that they were going to be hearing but never hearing, seeing but never seeing, that, that the people to whom he was called to preach would be deaf and blind and not heed his warnings of disaster. Isaiah's ministry, according to most scholars, began probably around 740 B.C., and extended at least to 700 B.C., maybe as far as into the 680s. So 40 to 60 years, Isaiah is speaking to a people who will not hear him. And then during that ministry, the armies of Assyria came, surrounded Israel, and God put to death 100,000 of them uh, because Hezekiah the king had prayed. And then 125 years later, 115 years later, in 586, Jerusalem falls to Babylon. Babylon has become the dominant power in the ancient Near East, and Babylon surrounds and destroys Jerusalem in 586. And then we fast forward 50-some years to around 538, where the Jews now return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, to rebuild the city. And this is under Cyrus, the king of Persia. So in this message, in Isaiah 64, Isaiah, kind of like John, if we think of John in Revelation, who, who sees the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, is transported in the spirit to that time ahead and describes those things to his hearers, to his readers. Isaiah is essentially in the same position. He is ministering somewhere in the late 
or, you know, the early 700 BCs into the late 600s. And, and so he sees beyond the invasion of Jerusalem to a time when there is a remnant in exile pleading for God to be faithful to his promises. And so he is transported into that future and speaks of it as though he were among the exiles in Babylon, though that destruction is 125 years or so in the future. So <clears throat> I see this, this message, if you will, of Isaiah as a prayer in chapter 64. It's in the midst of a larger prayer. If you have your ESV Bibles open, verse 15 of chapter 63, the little italic says, prayer for mercy. And this is a part of that prayer. And so there are four elements in that that I want us to look at uh, this morning together. One, one is a plea for presence. If you have your outline, you can follow on. One is a plea for presence. Second part of that pay, prayer is a profession of faith. The third part is confession of sin. And fourth is an appeal to covenant. These are people destroyed Jerusalem, taken into exile, crying out to God in the face of their situation in that day. And this is their prayer. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence. That's understandable, but why? Notice in, in, in verse 2, to make your name known to your adversaries and that the nations might tremble at your presence. Now, <clears throat> Isaiah 63 has spoken of the day of the Lord. As I said, the, Isaiah projects into that future when the judgment of God will fall upon the nation of Israel. At this point, just Judah, Judah and Benjamin. And so he speaks out of that. So in the midst of this disaster which has fallen, Isaiah speaks out this prayer. And if you look at verse 19 of chapter 63, we have become like those over whom you have never ruled, like those who are not called by your name. In other words, Lord, how are we different from the world around us? Look at what happened to us. You know, it recounts the disasters that have occurred your, your adversaries, our adversaries, have trampled down your sanctuary. Our world is upside down. It's in disarray. It is in the midst of destruction. And Father, we want you to come down. And yet Isaiah has spoken about that in previous passages. Back in Isaiah 33, he says this, the sinners in Zion are afraid Trembling has seized the godless. Who among us can dwell with the consuming fire? Who among us can dwell with everlasting burnings? Now, if you'll just sort of hold your finger there or put your bulletin in place there in, in Isaiah 64, turn with me just to Amos. Amos chapter 5. You'll find that on page 974. Isaiah is not the only voice crying out. For God, to, for God to act. But Isaiah says, th excuse me, Amos says this regarding this sought for day of the Lord, beginning in verse 18, which is on page 975. Hear these words. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light. As if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him or went into his house, leaned his hand against the wall, and a serpent bit him. In other words, you haven't escaped anything at all. You who pray for the day of the Lord, when it comes, you won't have escaped anything. For verse 20, is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light and gloom with no brightness in it? You see, the prophet's word, both Isaiah and Amos, is that you who cry for the, for the day of the Lord, for his presence to come down, for him to, to judge the nations, don't know what you're asking for. And I think about it in our time today. You know, part of my prayers over the years, I recognize, have been sort of, Lord, protect the U.S. of A., and particularly my place in it and my family's place in it. And, and you realize God does not have a nation today as he had the nation of Israel. 
His purpose in the nation of Israel, as we heard in Tom and Julie's song, was to bring a cradle into which our Savior could be born. Jesus, God incarnate, came to a, a people and a time and a place in history and geography. And that people was the nation of Israel, and that place was Bethlehem. And that time was, as we date now, you know, zero, the end of B.C. and the beginning of A.D. That was the reason for the nation. And then the nation of Israel passed away because Jesus himself was the fulfillment of God's promise. And, and so for me to pray rather selfishly that, you know, God would come down and, and judge all of them guys is, is mis is wrong. It's, it's unthinking. It's misunderstanding the nature of God's promise to his people. We are not the new Israel in the sense of having a land of our own. In fact, the writer of Hebrews says that, that all of those heroes of faith there in chapter 11 did not receive that which was promised, but they awaited its reception until we could join them in that. So there are children of God, people of God, yet not called into his kingdom and presence who we await and not a nation to become the new Israel. And so I think I in my prayer, and I, I trust some of us, we need to rethink, do we call down appeal to God's presence in an unthinking way, misunderstanding his promise, misunderstanding what has been offered to us in Jesus Christ? But the Israelites there begin their prayer with a plea for presence. And, and they cry for God's mercy, lamenting, even as I read there in verse 19 of chapter 16, we have become like those who are not called by your name. And so as they think about the name of God, they are led in verse 4 and 5 to a, a profession of faith. Notice this. From of old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No eye has seen a God beside you who acts for those who wait for him. See, the, the, the waiting for God is for him to do what he has promised to do. And, and they declare that there is no God beside Jehovah. This is a God who acts for those who wait for him. What other God is like that? You know, Isaiah is quite sarcastic in his denunciation of the idols and particularly of the idol makers. You know, he, he chides them for cutting down a tree and then taking half of it and, you know, baking their bread and warming their house and then taking the other half and carving an idol and, and bowing down to that. It's the same tree. And his sarcasm is, is rich and cutting. There is no God besides Jehovah who acts for those who wait for him. And, and they acknowledge that, that this God who acts is also a God who meets his people. Verse 5, you meet him who joyfully works righteousness. You recall Exodus thirty-three eleven. 11, we are told that the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. It, it's, it's that meeting that God calls us into, that God was calling his people into in that day. And yet, there's a qualifier. Verse 5, you meet him who joyfully works righteousness, those who remember you in your ways. The New English translation puts it this way, who delight in doing what is right, who observe your commandments. So this is the God that they are crying out to. The God who acts for those who wait. The, the God who meets those whom he has called into fellowship with him. A, a God who remembers or who, who joyfully works with us in righteousness, who grants righteousness in joy and then watches as we, in, as Paul says in, in Ephesians 2.10, you know, the works which God has prepared beforehand that we might do. God watches, you might say, with pleasure as we enter into those. I think of Chariots of Fire where Eric Little, in, in defending his training for the Olympics to his sister who thought he should be in missionary service, said, you know, God made me fast, and when I run fast, I feel his pleasure. 
God delights in us using the gifts that he has given us to, to serve him joyfully, but to remember his commandments, to observe his commandments. And so their profession is, is true and right. God is that kind of God, a God who acts, a God who meets, a God who, in essence, waits on those who wait on him. Now, these things are true about God, but they are not the truth about his people. And, and that's the third element of the prayer. The third element in this prayer of the exiles is a confession of sin. It begins right there in the middle of verse 5. Behold, you were angry and we sinned. In our sins, we have been a long time, and shall we be saved? The NIV says, but when we continued to sin against your ways, you were angry. Yes, God calls us to work righteousness, to remember his commandments, and yet we fail to do that, and we sin, and he is angry with us, with them. And Isaiah goes on. We have all become like one who is unclean. All our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We fade like a leaf. Our iniquities like the wind take us away. No one calls on your name. No one rouses himself to take hold of you. You've hidden your face from us. You've made us melt in the hand of our iniquities. See, the, the reality of, of the holiness of God, of his character, and yet of their own sinfulness, our own sinfulness, strikes us. Even, even as it did Paul. You recall Paul in, in Romans chapter 7 as he, as he struggles with the reality, as he says, I do not do the good I want, but the evil I don't want is what I keep on doing. Here's my sin, and here's me, and here's God, a holy God who looks down on these things. And Paul cries out, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? So in, in light of this plea for God's presence and the recognition that it's a holy fire and who can stand in the presence of God, we are led to acknowledge that, that God by his very character, by his holiness, has separated us from himself because we are sinful. And so the inescapable fact is that of our sinfulness, just as the exiles of Isaiah 64 recognize their own sinfulness. That's a fact. That is inescapable. And, and then that leads, of course, to the inescapable question in light of that fact, how then can we be saved? How then can we be saved? The reality of our sin, the reality of God's holiness, and how shall those two things ever be put together? Well, that leads to the fourth section of this prayer, an appeal to covenant. Notice verse 8. But now, or in the NIV, yet, 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 in spite of all these things, in spite of our wickedness, in spite of your holiness, we are your people. Oh, Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay. You are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. See, the only hope for, for the people of God in Isaiah's day was the faithfulness of God to his covenant promises. Remember not our iniquity forever. Behold, look, Lord, we are all your people. That's all they have. They can't point to any righteousness. They can't point to anything that would give them merit in God's sight. They can't point to any good that might come out of their lives. All they can acknowledge is we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But you, O oh Lord, are our Father. You are the potter. You are our maker. Above all and after all, we are your people. And that is the one and only hope that the Israelites have. That is the one and only hope which we have. You see, their, 
And their plea and their prayer is that this terrible anger of God at their iniquity would not last forever. That he would see their distress and the disaster which has befallen them and he would act. The chapter ends, verse 12, will you keep silent and afflict us so terribly? Put your bulletin again there in 64 and turn with me back just, beyond, just prior to uh, Amos in Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2, page 967. I want to read from verse 11 through 17 for you. For the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call in a, sal- a solemn assembly, gather the people. Verse 17, and say, spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? You see, the disaster which has befallen the Israelites in in Isaiah's day is a ground not just of condemnation to them, but in a very real way of reproach to the name of God himself. If you recall back in the Exodus, as, as God speaks to Moses regarding his intention to simply wipe out the Israelites. They are so sinful that God says, I I will destroy them. And Moses stands between that wrath and his people and says, Lord, if you do that, the nations will say, you weren't able to save them. You led them out into the wilderness only to have them die. In essence, your own name will be besmirched by the failure of your people. And God relents. And of course, Moses stands there in the figure of Jesus between God's wrath and us. And the Lord relents and and does not destroy his people. And this is the cry of Isaiah as we return return back to, to chapter 64. Be not so terribly angry, O Lord. Please look, we are all your people. You see... God, we wait for you to act for our salvation. And that salvation is not the destruction of earthly enemies. That salvation is not conquering of of Assyria or Babylon or Rome or Russia or you fill in the blank for our time and place in history. That is not the enemy that needs to be destroyed. It is, it is our sinfulness, and it is that conquering which we await. Now, we live on this side of the cross, and we know that, that Jesus has come, and in his death for us, the, the lamb who takes away the sin of the world, we have been given the victory. Thanks be to God, says Paul. We are more than conquerors through him who has loved us. Chapter 8, verse 1. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. See, that victory has been won. That, that promise of salvation, which was offered in material, political, geopolitical terms to the nation of Israel, was simply a symbol for the salvation that is offered to all through faith in Jesus Christ. In his death upon the cross, the victory was won. It is finished he cried. And so so we now are the recipients, the possessors, the inheritors, the participants in that victory, and it is ours. Jeremiah speaks to to the hope of the ancient Israelites in these words in in Lamentations chapter 3, but I think they also describe the word of God to us and our words. Remember He cries out to the Lord. Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. 
My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His covenant mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness to your word, to your promise, to your covenant. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. The Old Testament prophets almost are in unison chorus here as they speak to us of God's promise and the hope that we wait. And so, so in this season of Advent, this season of waiting, I want to suggest just four things in conclusion that we can participate in to be renewed and strengthened in our hope. One, of course, as we, as we have done this morning in song and in, and in thought, even in prayer, we recall Jesus' first coming. His, his righteous life and death, his resurrection, his ascension. We recall that as the fulfillment of God's promised salvation to the whole world, to all of humankind. Remember, at the beginning, he spoke to Abraham, and in your seed, all the nations of the world will be blessed. And that promise has come in Jesus Christ. And in Advent as well, then, as we go through this season, we are encouraged that God will have compassion on his people and will, in fact, surely rescue them from both political, ultimately, and spiritual oppression in and through that kingdom. Remember, John sees that vision of a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And there is no more evil, no more sin, no more death, no more dying. All those things are gone, and the new has come. And also, in this season of Advent, we can be renewed in, in revealing our confidence in, in God's promise by the way we live. Peter, in, in 2 Peter, says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the elements will be burned up, and this whole earth will pass away. And he says, what kind of people then ought you to be? How then should we live? And we need to live in, in obedience, as Isaiah's prayer reminds us, and in humility and with joy as we live out that faith. And finally, we're reminded in this season of Advent that it is good to wait in hope for God's salvation. We don't know what Never mind the new administration will bring. We don't know what the next five years will bring. We don't know what the next five minutes will bring. But we can live waiting in hope for God's salvation. Let's bow together. Father, we rejoice in this season of Advent. Quiet us, I pray, before you. Give to our hearts a lightness and a joy as we rejoice in and remember your faithfulness. And so, Lord, we acknowledge that this world and all in it is in your hand, and we wait for the final consummation of your purpose and for your kingdom to come. And we look to these things with expectancy, not only in the season of Advent, but through all the days that you may grant us. And we rejoice in hope. In Jesus' name, amen.